I'm glad it's true. I'm glad it's true. You see, I feel like we sang this recently. I feel like it's a very appropriate song given a long and tenuous week, right? Uh, so we're going to, uh, or stressful week. 381. Oh, I'm so sorry, 381. <laughs> I wanted you to know that. I wanted you to know that in your hearts, in the Rolodex of your minds. Rolodex. Man, it's been a while. They were. <laughs> All righty, Laura, would you play the introduction? Hey, think about this song if we sing it together. How's that? All together now. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a Lord is the glory be mine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. my song, praise me my Savior all the day long, this is my story, this is my song, praise me my Savior all the day long, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of Bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day Submission, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, blessed in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. You sound a little different this morning. I mentioned a song last week. Uh, that was spiritually related, if you will, to that song. Um, excuse me. Um, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I wanted to say ten thousand reasons. Yeah, that's the same one. Yeah. yeah. When they have when they have two titles, it always messes me up. I'm not complicated enough for that. Um, but it's that song, "My Jesus, I Love Thee." And so I asked Amber if she would sing that with me this morning. I asked her about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and she, you ain't wrong, brother. You ain't wrong. And uh, I like congregational singing. I like it when the church sings together. That's one of the reasons we're not super crazy about churches that I love loud music. I love that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a kid at heart. And, and uh, some of you might say, you're still a kid, period. Fine with me. Um, but I don't like it when it's so overpowering. You can't even hear yourself and others sing, right? You know, in fact, the early church up into the first several hundred years of their existence eschewed musical instruments. Even as late as the 16th century, you can find biblical, author, biblical authors, Christian authors writing about how John Calvin particularly said the organ was the devil's music box. Well, right there you go, there you go. Um, and you say the organ that's pretty mild I know but the the feeling was especially if you read some Jerome on this it's really interesting um, how Christians voices were all the instrument that many people felt like they needed now I don't take that slant at all but I will say it is very easy to lose sight of what we're singing for the sake of singing forest for trees right um, so I say all that to say I like congregational singing we don't show up to church to be sung to by like seven people 
as we mumble along, right? We sing together. Now, in a stunning contradiction to everything I've just told you, um, I should say exception to be sure, I also think there's a great call for special music, as it's called in our denominational tradition, where one person or a group will sing a song while others listen and contemplate on the meaning. This too can be a great opportunity to worship in one's heart as you make the song your own as you hear it ministered to you. Remember when Adam sang No More Night last week? I think that was a wonderful opportunity to listen and rejoice in the truth of No More Night and, and, and enjoy the hope that that provides. And so please listen as my wife and I will sing this song, My Jesus, I Love Thee, uh, to you this morning. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, if you know it all together. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing. I'll sing with the glittering crown. Amen. Good job, church. Thank you, wifey. Clap all day, man. I don't care. You know, it's great, too, because we kind of had this break in special music. And then when Adam was singing last week, I wanted to clap and do a little bit of shouting. But I was like, can I do this? I have free. Yeah, right. Adam's like, please, I need the encouragement, man. Come on. No, and here's the thing, right? I have been in churches where you're not allowed to clap. Yes. This is Brian's fault for the next three minutes of your life. He took this from you, not me. No, he's joking. I've been in churches where you're not allowed to clap because they say, all glory be to God, not man. Okay. I mean, okay. And here's the hilariously ironic part. Have you ever watched a football game with me? No. <laughs> your game, brother. My loss, but your gain. There was one time I was watching. It was, it was, it was, it was the highlights, maybe, or maybe the actual game. It was a game, a Patriots game, 
And my children, they weren't just like concerned or bothered. They chastised me. Scared. They were frightened. Because dad doesn't yell. I'm not a yeller, right? And so this guy, he caught a great pass. I went, yes, yeah. And my children were, dad, that really hurt my ears. And I'm like, listen, I'm really sorry. I've shattered and disrupted the harmony of our home. <laughs> yeah, great job. But here's the thing, right? We cheer for and we clap for things that we love and that we're excited about. So everybody's like, well, clapping for in church is okay if it's clapping for Jesus. Stop this. Let's not make rules around this stuff. We clap and cheer when we're happy. When they, you know, found that fella deceased, I was like, yes. Not because I celebrated the death of a human life, but because the danger is over and we know it, right? We're excited about things, guys. When Jesus comes back, some of y'all, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And you came. I'm really thankful for this opportunity to see you and uh, to congregate in the assembly of, uh, oh, it's 12. I'm, listen, Jesus, I really appreciate it. You're going a little bit long. No, come on, guys. I'm just, I'm just being real. Like, it's okay to be excited. That's actually one of the cool things. That, I'm so glad you said that, Brian. I really am. Because if there, I'll tell you, ooh, mm, I got to calm down. Usher, would you come forward, take the offering? At least I can keep something moving while I'm talking. But there, I have been in churches where there's a congregational song that everybody sings together, and they clap at the end of it. They just clap. It was really cool. I've been in church. In fact, I think when we went to New City for a few times, there was a song that was sung that everybody sang together, and at the end, people just started clapping. You say that is so inappropriate. I think it's fully appropriate. Kev? Can we do that when you're finally done preaching? You know what? <laughs> If it means we're being genuine and coming out of our shells a little bit, then yes. <laughs> no, no. I've only just begun to quote the Carpenter's theological song. <laughs> because of that, Kevin is tithing double. And uh, <laughs> Steve's like, well, let's get out of this. Let's keep going. Steve, would you pray for the offering, please, sir? Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we can come together and just. Enjoy a time of fellowship with uh, your people, Lord, and brothers and sisters. Lord, to hear your word preached and taught. And Lord, we just ask that you be with us now. Lord, your will be done in our midst. We thank you for the offering. Amen. Cheryl has some announcements, yes, and she's going to come up and give those while I get outfitted with my fancy mic pack, and then I'm going to preach a message. Oh, man, I'm excited about this lesson. I am, oh, I'm so excited. You can do whatever you want with that. Okay. Well, um, we're going to chill out with Chili today after church. Um, and the axes and apps is uh, the next thing. Oh, no, actually, I didn't bring it. It's on the bulletin board, more information. Uh, Thursday, November 2nd is for people that signed up for the CareNet dinner. Um, at, doors open at 6 o'clock at St. John's Fellowship Hall. I'm not sure where the fellowship hall is. I'm just going to follow the crowd. So, so if I find that, I'll stand out front and go. So, in point. <laughs> so, then the next thing is Tuesday, November 14th at, uh, um, at 30. Okay, 30 seconds? No, actually it's uh, at 5.30. Um, Smitty's Game Lab tops, and we're going to do the axes and apps. The cut rate price of $1.50 per 15 minutes. Wear closed shoes to prevent accident and uh see and i and i have this on the bulletin board and it's got the, the link for smitty's online menu so you can peruse what you're going to have while you're throwing access yes yeah it does i made a mistake it's i have a new computer i'm throwing it on that so yeah i'm going to write a little five in there so it's at 5 30 so p.m so then the men's breakfast is Saturday, November 18th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Ron and Britt are providing the food and cooking. If Britt's cooking, let's bring Tums. And it's just for men. <laughs> Good advice. So um, then I thought it would be nice. Um, I do have a sign-up sheet for Sunday, December 3rd, right after church. We're having Thanksgiving Christmas, which I call Thankmas. I like that. And, uh, so um, sign up to bring something. And then, um, and I got cool napkins for it. I just threw it upon myself. I saw these really cool napkins, so I brought it. 
And um, then I thought it'd be nice for the ladies to get together. So Sunday, December 10th, the ladies of the church bring a bag lunch for after church and then bring your cutout cookies. And you don't have to just make gingerbread or, or uh, sugar cookies if you don't want to. I'm thinking of bringing my rolled out chocolate cookies and my eggnog cookie recipe. That's what I'm thinking of using. Man. Yeah. And so we're going to have the gluten-free table segregated so it doesn't get contaminated. I can guarantee I'll bring all the icings and stuff, and I'll guarantee that they're gluten-free, dairy-free. And then we'll have little decorations, and you can bring some decorations if you want. And we can decorate the cookies, and we could even have a kids' table if kids want to participate too. And uh, um, and that's it. Thanks. Boom. All right, I'm just letting you know you're setting the expectation kind of high, right? <laughs> Thank you, Micah. She gets it, Ralph. <laughs> Ralph's like, you're worthy of a couple, a couple. <laughs> what what I really want is a slow clap eventually. You know, we'll be, we'll be, yeah. Right. And then in 15 minutes will be the next one when I'm in the middle of preaching. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Topsonbaptist.com is where you can find all these events, except for the most recent one that we just added. Um, you can look at that and say, hey, what is it? What are we supposed to bring? I'm going to be adding some details and things right on the calendar event. So if you go to the website, uh, top, www.topsonbaptist.com. I think it's forward slash events, but I'm not sure about the, the short code. So just click on events or calendar at the top banner, and uh, there is where you will find it. It's a very plain Google calendar that's just imported from, uh, from, from, from Google's cloud. And at any time, I can just pull up my phone and in 30 seconds have an event on that calendar. So it's very, very cool. We can modify on the fly. Um, so that'll be there. If you say, Pastor, I thought it was this date, not that one, shoot me a text. I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. As we learn and grow and become accustomed to having an event board, a bulletin board and things like that, which is super cool as we grow. Oh, it's awesome. And uh, and then have an online calendar. It's, it's going to be really great. Kevin and I have been talking a little bit more lately about just the growth of the church and how excited we are about how how it feels, right? There's a great feeling here. Um, as we grow, Satan is going to... Listen, I, I, I told you, I'm not... I don't know half as much as I used to because half as much as I used to is probably all wrong. But I, I don't know hardly anything about angels and demons and Satan and all that. But I can tell you that Satan as a spiritual evil force in this world seeks to divide churches that are doing his work. If we're dead and doing nothing, he's not going to care. But as we grow and as we love each other, he's going to make sure that we shrink and stop loving each other. You know what I'm saying? And so we need to be ever vigilant and on the lookout that as we grow, I want you to know, pastorally speaking, I'm trying to help us understand, expect trouble, expect friction, Expect disagreements. Expect things to bother you that never bothered you before. You say, you're just being weird and willy-nilly because it's Halloween. I am being weird. I'm not being willy-nilly, and it has nothing to do with Halloween. I can promise you that the, the Bible teaches us that Satan is, he walks around as a roaring lion looking to devour whoever he can. So something to keep in mind. I got popcorn balls this morning. My son asked me, what are popcorn balls? I love that my son had to ask me that. You'll notice he still has all of his teeth, right? Uh, so if you don't know what they are, Consider yourself blessed. Uh, we're going to do a very, very brief review. Ladies and gentlemen, what book of the Bible are we in in our sermon series? Jaybird. Philippians, that is correct. Popcorn Ball, Haribo Gold Bears, Reese's, Twizzlers, Skittles, or Kit Kat? Yeah, you will. It's a ball. It's perfect for throwing. Oral Hershiser. Yeah, come on. That was amazing. And the clapping. I love this. I love this. Brian, you're the man. He brought it into our midst. This is good doctrine. All right. No, that's good, man. I don't like you having fun in church. Then you're out of here. No, I'm just joking. That's terrible. No, no. You're safe. You're safe. <laughs> Kevin, help me. All right, no. <laughs> oh, man, good stuff. Okay. Uh, we've been in Philippians. What sermon number is this? I will not be offended if you get it wrong. We've been at this for a little bit. Trig? So close, dude. So close. 49. No. <laughs> right? Come on. All right. Uh, Anastasia. Seven? Nope. Bella? Five. five. Yes, it's his sermon number five. Bella, I got, I'm not, sorry, babe. The popcorn ball, it would have to be split between all four of you. I love you too much to hurt you. Uh, so <laughs> you say, you're a terrible dad. <laughs> you can't have it all right now all right 
In fact, don't eat it right now. It'll get crumbs all over the place. Adults, sure, I don't care, but my chilling. Babe, I gave my daughter a popcorn ball. Please help me. Um, it's actually not terrible. 110 calories per. There's 14 grams of sugars, and 28% of your daily value of added sugars in the popcorn ball. Be careful. Um, all things in moderation, right? Okay, so this is sermon series number or sermon number five. Um, let's see. Let's see. I got I got two more to ask. I got I got to do two more. Where's my preaching Bible? I tried to find it this morning, but I couldn't find oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Hey, you need breakfast. I'm not kidding, man. I don't know where it is. My preaching Bible. Oh, Cheryl knows where it is. Cheryl, she's just trying to get candy. You know that, right? I'm just trying to get on Um, Thank you, Cheryl. You really are a wonderful lady. That's the one. That's the one. I am so thankful. No, 10 4. Thank you so much. It's my fault. I need to actually put it in the same place every week. No comment from my wife. She will agree with that. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. My suit jacket. You know where I found the suit jacket? Literally in my office. No, it was up here. And I said, yeah, I think that works. So I just wore it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Correct. Correct. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> what? Oh, my wife. The look she's giving me. It's love, but it's also like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Yeah. All right. The checks don't work together, huh? The checkers and checkers? Barely. She says, she says, hide behind the pulpit and you'll be okay. <laughs> Philippians chapter three. No, okay. Here we go. All right. So we're in Philippians chapter one. What's a, what's a couple of key words that might go with how we've been talking about Philippians? Uh, Paul's mentality or the theme of the book, Red. Ooh, yes, beautiful. Yes, participation. Any particular candy? If there's a Reese's Pieces in there, I think there should be that one. There are Reese's Pieces. There are. There'll be Jasmine. I don't want to hit her in the head. All right. Yeah, what's another What's another word that might go with? Yeah, participation. Anybody remember the Greek word for it? This is just a nerdy extra question. It's koinonia. Koinonia. Um, and you say, how do I remember that? Not that you should have to, but participation in this sense has to do with financial support. Coin. Koinonia, ah, it helps. Anyway, anybody else with some words that Paul might have used or some some feelings that Paul felt as he's opening up this letter? Kev? Fellowship? Fellowship? Which one do you want, boss? He's like, I'm all set. I'll give it to the kids. All right. You guys can come up and pick one afterwards. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, it'll, it'll be a, yeah. Um, all right. Everybody's like, I want a popcorn ball. Um, Amber? Gratitude, yes, thankfulness, gratitude. Did you want anything in particular? You want Reese's peanut butter cup? Yeah, Reese's peanut butter cup. Watch the watch the harmony and the synergy between husband and wife. <laughs> okay, okay. It still got there through trials and tribulations. It's a spiritual lesson. Turning your Bible to First Corinthians. No, I'm just joking. Okay, last one. Any anybody else? A, a word, Dennis. What is it? That's from today's, so it's kind of cheating. No, love is absolutely a part of it. Which one do you want? Whatever. Popcorn ball. Uh, it's Listen, it's light. It has weird aerodynamic properties, and it's in a bag. I know. I was very thankful. I was like, if this goes south, and it did. All right, Kev. Soon there goes. Oh, oh, oh. Um. Coin and a uh, soon. It started with soon. Suni koinonos. Yeah, Suni koinonos. Yeah, uh, soon soon koinonos. Yes, and it has to do with sunergos and koinonia. Has to do with participation of fellowship. It's a partnership. Ah, oh, beautiful word. Anybody else? Just this is this is often called the theme of the book. Uh, Cheryl. Talk about like confirmation of the gospel. Oh yeah, the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Any chocolate for you, Pearl or yeah. Cheryl? It should be a little sugar-free squirt in there. There are indeed. <laughs> yep, they're in there. There's Hershey's eggs. Oh, are those from Easter? Here's one. I got it. Are you ready for this? Boom! Y'all ready for this? The word I was, yes, Kim. Joy! Thank you. She. I was just about to go ballistic. Kim, any particular? I got. Uh, you're a chocolate person, so I have white chocolate and dark chocolate Reese's. I also have um, Kit Kats. 
Kit Kat. Break me off a piece of that applesauce. All right. Turning to Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. We're doing just super on time. You say, Britt, why do you mention the time? Because this is the last time I'll mention it until we're done. <laughs> Y'all acting like you know me so well. Could you do? All right. Uh, praise the Lord. I'm so thankful that God allows us to have the joy, right? Because I tell you what, I don't, guys, I'm being very transparent with you. If I, if I was living life as, and I'm not slamming or condescending on people of an atheistic or agnostic persuasion, but if I was persuaded of those things, I would be living in constant existential dread, knowing that my mortality is hurling me at 100 miles an hour toward the grave with no purpose, no hope. Guys, I don't know how they do it. I don't. I don't know why you'd want to do that. I find myself looking into Jesus and saying, to whom else would I go? He has the words of eternal life. Susan? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, in Philippians, I don't see that yet. What's that? Yeah, I don't know that we've covered that yet. That's in verse 27. And so we'll be there in a few weeks, I am sure. But, oh, no, in Philippians, what's that? I thought you were just studying Philippians. Oh, no, we've only just begun. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I know. You say Sermon 5, we should be a little further along. <laughs> farther along, we'll know all about it. But that day is not today. <laughs> oh, amen. What's that, Kim? Oh, I thought somebody, oh, I thought somebody said something. Oh, Sheila. I was trying to figure you out. Oh, I tell you what, my wife's still working on it. It won't happen for a while. Oh, I praise the Lord we're able to be here with joy in our hearts. There is hope. There is joy. Um, well, right, and um, if you look back, just it depends on what Bible you have. It may be a page, it may be two pages back, depending on the size of your print or whatnot. But right over back in Ephesians five nineteen, it says, "Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God." And it's like this is this this in my mind conveys a spirit of. Among many other things, levity, saying, God, we are thankful. We are praising you for the gift of life that you've given us, and, and within it, the meaning of life that you bestow upon us, the image of God. It's wonderful. And um, anyway, all right, so today's sermon is called What True Love Does. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help me as we jump into this lesson together. Lord, I'm so thankful for the time you've given us this morning. I, I have just probably too good of a time up here and just um, spending time with the church that I love so, so much. Um, I ask that you would speak through me, to me, and to all of us in this room as we jump into Philippians chapter 1 and, and hear what Paul has to say next as he's writing what you would want us to read providentially. I thank you so much for the truth and the wisdom contained in this little wonderful letter. May it benefit our lives May your spirit work in us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we've studied in the last four weeks together in Philippians, Paul opens up his letter with a brilliant and grateful introduction, stating his love for the church in the most heartfelt of ways, while also expressing his, and this was the last sermon that we did, remember? He expressed his confidence. He expressed his confidence that Christ would continue being generous to him through the church at Philippi. And again, we talked about this all last week. I'm not going to beat the, beat the dead horse. That's a terrible illustration. I'm not going to go back and forth over the same thing, but, but I will say this. Um, it is so easy to grab verses and we say, this means this to me, this means this to me. And that's actually what today's message is kind of about, is looking at sound doctrine over personal revelation or pragmatic private practice. Um, we're going to talk about that this morning because it's what Paul talked about in his letter. So the text simply means, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it or perform it. That's verse 6. And then in verse 7, he says, it is very appropriate for me to feel this way of you. I've got you in my heart because you've been with me in my bonds and as I'm standing trial, defending the gospel, um, and you all are partakers of my grace. And then in verse 8, he ended where we were last week saying, I, I'm telling you the truth. The way that Jesus feels about you, I feel that way about you and I miss you. 
I miss you something fierce. Um, it's almost a parental love, isn't it? Do you sense that maybe when you read Paul's letters? Surely if you read any of Paul's letters, you sense that fatherly feeling. You say, that's, I don't, I don't, you know, he's not, he's not my father. No, I understand this. But the churches that he was a part of and the churches that he helped form and gave his life for, he did the same thing for them that fathers and mothers do for their children. They pour their lives into them. My wife and I were watching that great theological program, Great British Baking Show, last night. And the, the one young lady, she got star baker, and she began to cry. And she said, as a mom, everything I do is for others. And so it's really nice to kind of get the recognition to be star baker this week. And I thought, that's pretty cool, right? I, I, I processed it. I was like, I thought, no, that's actually pretty cool, right? And uh Remember, if anybody else would just get on and join the rest of the show, I'm sitting there analyzing every word. You know, what is, it, is it doctrinal truth? No, but like, but I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. And, and Paul, the Bible literally says, like he wrote to churches, I am willing to be spent for you. I'm willing to be poured out for you. Why? Because that's how Jesus lived for us, man. You, uh, Kevin's text this morning, it included that Jesus had to separate from the crowd and go up to a mountain to pray. That's the kids, man. That's the kids. Mom and dad need a break once in a while, especially mom. If she stayed at home all day with the kids, you get it, right? That's the kids. And so Jesus goes and he's like, all right, kids, I need you to please stay and not fight for like two seconds. Remember Moses on Mount Sinai, right? That didn't work out too well. He comes down. What are you doing? Look, uh, this calf popped out of the gold. <laughs> they, literally, they literally said that. This calf just popped out. Oh, uh, who did it? Aaron, you know what I mean, Aaron, right? It's just exactly that. So Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray, and he has to separate himself from the people. In the other text that Kevin used, the exact same thing happened. He got into a boat, and they left the crowd. He was always crowded. He always had kids going, Dad, Dad, Dad. Remember when, remember when the Sons of Thunder, come on, guys, this is a good little tangent. The Sons of Thunder, James and John, the Sons of Boanerges, right? Their mom came up to Jesus now, I haven't seen The Chosen. I don't know how it plays out. Have they covered this in Chosen yet? Sure they have. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I'm not against it. I just haven't gotten around to it. And, uh, and they come up to Jesus, at least mom does, on their behalf, and said, okay, we, we just need to make, <laughs> come on, it sounds so silly, but we just need to make sure that when you do set up your kingdom, then you're going to wipe out the Romans and everything, they're going to die, and you're going to be king. And where are we going to, like, are we going to be, like, up with you in the throne room? Are there, is it going to be, like, knights at the round table kind of thing where we all have a seat, or how does that work out? Just wondering. But they couldn't say it, so they had Mama come and say it, right? You know, I know it's kind of, I don't know, man, right? But it's always, like, need, need, dad, dad. And Jesus never, guys, he never got irritated with that. His love with an infinite well of mercy and compassion. Come on, this is huge. This is huge. So Paul, why do you think he is just writing letter after letter after letter? Because he's getting people coming to him over and over. Paul, 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 you wouldn't believe what's happening over here in Corinth. This guy, he is like his stepmom, and they're having relations, and you wouldn't believe it. It's so nasty. And then Paul, listen, and then there's these people speaking in tongues, but nobody can understand what they're saying. And you get what I'm saying? And so Paul is writing these letters. He is being spent, being poured out for these people. You go, oh, I'm feeling weary and tired just thinking about that. Now imagine a whole lifetime of being poured out for the people you love. Now you get to sit down and write them a letter. I want you to feel that, that compassion, that love, that investment, all coming through in every letter Paul writes. Does that make sense for a setting for this morning? So now Paul continues in verse Nine. We're going to read the first. We're going to read nine, ten, and eleven. That's going to be our text this morning. Here's what he says. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. And there's a lot of stuff coming up in verse 12 that Paul's talking about. Now, I want you to know that all this bad stuff that's happened is actually a really good thing, right? And it's really cool how he goes into that. But these three verses are so important to learn. Now, I'm not going to do this like we did last time. This is my prayer for you, that your love will continue, mature into epignosis, and then there's a whole bunch of Greek words. And six of them that I really kind of wanted to break down and go through each one, but you'll see in my notes here, that's a lot of red Greek words today. I wouldn't put them in the sermon unless they're important. But um, 
instead of going into each one in a screen like this, you know how we've done this before so far in the series, we do the Greek word up there and then we define it. With so many, I'm not going to do that this time. You can pull out a strong concordance or some of the better concordances out there. Even better yet, go to Logos, learn some of the context in which some of these words were used. But instead, I'm just going to present and define these words in our paraphrase of these three verses before we move into the text and the three points this morning. That makes sense? Okay, so here's the paraphrase. Paul says this, and this is my prayer for you, that your love would continue to mature into complete awareness and discernment so that you test and allow only the superior, better things so that you're found genuine and faultless and free from sinful hangups until the return of the master, furnished and filled to the brim with Christ's righteousness, operating in and bearing fruit in you all to the praise of and glory of God. You say, that's, that sounds kind of, you know, very, very defined. Like you're reading the Amplified Bible without the brackets, you know what I mean? Like you're all those extra definitions. But it's really, really important. I'm going to read it to you again. Again, this is in lieu of defining each Greek word individually. You guys can have a blast with that. But for sake of time and not to bore you out of your skulls, I thought I would just define them and put them here to help us understand how Paul was using these words. Because there's things in our King James Bible than any Bible called false friends. Anybody know what a false friend is? It's a word that you might read and you say, oh, yes, this means this. Susan mentioned one. Only let your conversation. Well, today when I think of a conversation, what do I think of? Like when Corey and I were talking to each other this morning about how the Tennessee Vols destroyed the Kentucky Wildcats yesterday. Amen. You say, what is that? It was our conversation. <laughs> but the way Paul used the word conversation, he was talking about their lifestyle. Does that make sense? So you say, well, that's an easy one. You're right, it's an easy one. But there's hundreds, maybe thousands of these false friends in our Bible that the words are used in different ways today than they were back then. So to help us understand the mind of the biblical author, sometimes it's very important to do something like this. So Paul is asking, he's praying to God that their love would mature into complete awareness and discernment. We call that circumspection. We call that slowing down and looking around. Kev talked about that this morning. When things happen to us, a lot of times we can have knee-jerk reactions. But we need to, when we can, as soon as we can, slow down, take stock of what's going on, and respond appropriately. This is what the Bible says when it said, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Right? As a parent, I've had to practice that. I have, and I know you have too. As a pastor, as a church member, however, whatever your role is, as a husband, as a wife, we need to practice that. Slow down, be discerning, be aware. So then this word, he says that you may approve things that are excellent. Now, today, when I look at the word approve, what do I think? I think of a red stamp, right? Approved. It's really interesting how those two letters AP before the word prove kind of changes the connotation in our mind today, but that's not the way it was. Approve literally means to prove, to test and then allow by the things that are okay. So when we say, I'm going to approve this, Today, that means it's already been tested and I'm just going to stamp it. But to approve something in a fuller sense of the word means I'm going to do the testing and then I'm going to allow it once it's tested. Does that make sense? So we're not just, we're not just letting things by the gates of our mind. We're going to test and allow only the better thing. This is really cool. Look at this word. He says that you may approve things that are excellent. This carries an understanding of something that is superior. Literally, the translation is better than. You can approve things that are excellent. So it's not about saying, this is sinful, I'm not going to do it. It's about saying, what is best? What is best? And we're going to chat about that in a second. Core. Um, well, Rob, another thing when you think of, uh, when I think of improve, you improve yourself so you make yourself better. Improve, yeah. Now here's what's really interesting. Approve, improve. Do you think they're similar? Approve, testing something without. Improve, what do you think that means? We're proving ourselves and getting better. You see what's happening here? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great example. Okay, so think about this. That you may be sincere and without offense. This has to do with being genuine and faultless. And without offense, you can look at the other ways this Greek word is translated in the New Testament. It has to do with being um, no cause to offend or no sinful hang-ups. So that when the master returns, we're not sitting here saying, you gave me one talent and I buried it. You understand what I'm saying? we can say, I made good use of the things you gave me. So that's, that's kind of what this text is saying in the best way I know how to explain it. Now, 
Um, you'll notice that all of this has to do with the blossoming of love into something more full and complete. So I want to just very, very quickly take a look at three things about how Paul approaches mature love in our text this morning. Now, you might be reading this text with me and saying, Britt, sounds like you've got about 15 minutes left. You have a very short amount of time. Oh, I said I wasn't going to mention the time again. I'm sorry. Anyway, you have a very, I know you were right, man. You win. You win. You say you've got a short amount of time to try to tell us that this passage really has to do with love. It does, though. Look at verse 9. And this I pray that your love, he's already experienced their love. Their love has contributed to him financially. It's stuck by him in the hard time. And now he says, I want that love to mature and blossom into something more mature, something more complete, something perfect. Are you following me so far? That your love may abound yet more and more. In what? More giving? He said they're already giving as much as they can. In what? Um... Uh, greeting each other with a holy kiss, taking the little step. No, no, no. He's talking about a very particular thing. I want your love to abound more and more in knowledge and all judgment. So point number one of three, true love looks and learns. True love looks and learns. There's a lot of sentimental love out there, isn't there? Any, have you ever watched any uh, Kansas City Chiefs game this year? Half the screen time is dedicated to one Taylor Swift. Aren't you a Swifty? I've never listened to one of her songs. I, I haven't. Do you hate her? No. No, I just don't know her. But from what I understand, she's, she's kind of been with and broken up with about a dozen guys and then write songs about them. So Kelsey should probably at this point get like a trademark on his name or something because it's going to go down. Now, you say that's awfully mean of you to characterize Taylor Swift. They could really get married and stay together forever. They absolutely could. This is really not about them. But the point is that I do tend to think about that sort of thing when I think about what the world's idea of love is. I love you. No, you don't. How do you know? You just met me four seconds ago. <laughs> now, there's a very real sense in which we can love someone with the love of Christ without knowing them, right? But I think the world's idea of love is you say, you ever heard of love at first sight? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate love at first sight because I felt something like that toward my wife. I saw her picture and I was like, I love what I see. <laughs> I love her. And then I saw her in person and I was like, I was right to love this woman. Oh, I love her so much. And I'm like at Arby's, I was working and they came in. I was in high school. She was in college. She's not that much older than me. No, no. It's a, and there I am. It's a great story. I'll tell it to you sometime. And then Amber will correct it a bunch of times. I'm sure it's needed because it's, you know, no, no. But I said, oh, my goodness, I love her to death. But here's the thing. Uh, puppy love is real to the puppies, right? But it's not really a mature form of love because I found that out in my first, second year of marriage that I thought I loved her, but I still love myself more than anybody else. The love I had for her was all self-serving to me. Did that make sense? You say, well, there's no marriage that's perfect at first. And I agree with you. I think that, but, but listen, what I wrote in my text here, we've all seen spurious, emotional, gushing displays of affection. And they may be very gentle, gen genuine, if not sinful necessarily, but it's different in kind from old, aged commitment. Now, I'm not in support of a husband and wife sitting around when they're 85 years old, just yelling at each other, yapping like dogs and cats at each other around the dinner table. It's a caricature, right? You know? And in the end, well, we go to bed happy. You know, we just kind of learned, you know. It's like, dude, hold her hand, you know. She'd probably stab it. Okay, that may be true, but dude, come on. We've all seen it. The old married couple that's been married for 160 years, and they just, they've come to an understanding, okay. I'm not looking at anyone with eye contact right now. It's not happening. I'm looking right above where I normally look when I want to stay out of trouble. <laughs> Now, it's very easy for me to criticize because I'm not there, but I do think there's some real opportunity for improvement in the old, you know, fight and marry couple, right? But there is a very real sense in which that husband and that wife are infinitely more connected to each other than the one-year couple who doesn't, you know, go back and forth at each other quite so much. Does that make sense? I'm not condoning couples fighting. I think there needs to be a Christ-like spirit in every stage of marriage, okay? But there is a sense... And when you can look at a newlywed and go, oh, it's just so beautiful. They never fight. They're just in love. 
That's called a honeymoon, guys, right? And real love, real love is, I'll tell you what, grape juice and wine, two totally different beverages, and the only thing that changes it is time, right? And I, I understand where, you know, the, the alcohol and everything, but in general, the idea of a wine is it's, it's better for you and tastes better, et cetera, et cetera, than grape juice. Grape juice is new and it's sweet and it's, yeah, I'm gonna run around the auditorium, right? But when you think about wine, you don't think about people going on benders with wine, you think about people sitting down around a fireplace, you know, a little, you know what I'm saying, right? It has this idea of something aged and careful and refined. Does that make sense so far? So this idea of love, there is, there is a love that says, man, I am just going to give her everything. No, that's your college fund. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm dropping out of college because she needs to be an actress. Stop doing this, you know, giving everything, making crazy. There, there is a, there's a place for that, I suppose. Maybe not dropping out of college to give all your college money to somebody else, but you say, where do you get that illustration? I came pretty close. I was given a sum of money from when my grandfather passed away. By the time I graduated college, that sum of money was gone because I had a girlfriend, not Amber, who, uh, who could not pay her bills. So I paid for college twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did she graduate? Oh, no. Anyways, moving right along, <laughs> that was that first form of love. But the mature love, the love that is experienced between two people, that is a very mature and age love. Now, how does this apply to doctrine, Britt? In Paul's mind, love is meant to grow past the emotional and move to the substantial, but this is not seen in many, if not most, churches today. Guys, I'm going to be very transparent with you. This is what I'm going to kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, show my hand. OK, I, I struggle. I wrestle with a lot of the church presentations that you walk in and it's giving you this gushy emotional experience. But there's very little doctrine being preached. And you should struggle with that, too, because what that does is it keeps people at that first level of love. Does that make sense so far? And when you then move from the emotional, it is not a bad thing to have emotion. When we show up in church and we're singing songs like 10,000 Reasons or stuff like that, we should feel the emotion. We should feel that. But that should never be the epitome, the zenith, the paramount, the climax, the peak of our love. That should be something that has its place and we experience it and we love it and it supports everything else. But if we did away with that, we would still have the aged meats, the aged wine, the doctrine. Does that make sense for you? I could, I, I, I've said enough on that piece for right now. So true love looks and learns and it moves past the emotional. And I'm going to be very transparent with you on this too. There are entire churches and denominational traditions that are founded on personal emotional experiences. That is, that is not, again, I'm not saying any of these guys are doing anything bad. But love, true love, grows into an embrace of sound doctrine because true love looks and learns. It doesn't just blindly rush around giving away their college money. Did that make sense to you? All right, moving on to point number two. Point number two, verse two. We're digging this verse by verse. The Berean true love discerns and discards. Discerns and discards. In the words of the great theologian and poet, and Nobel laureate, Kenny Rogers. <laughs> you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. He said, come on, that's silly. No, it's really honestly the first thing I think about. You get dealt the hand of cards. Somebody, somebody says, all right, we're playing Texas Hold'em. You get two, and it's a 7-2 offsuit. Anybody who plays a little bit of Texas Hold'em knows that if you have a seven of one color and a two of another color, fold. You don't stand a chance of winning anything. You got to drop out. You got to discard. No, but I'm really excited about this hand. And I tell you what, I got a hunch and my gut never lies to me. Mm -hmm. Your gut is lying. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> fold. But I don't feel like I should fold. Fold. But, you know, I'll tell you what, my great, great grandpappy, he had a 7-2 offsuit. And stop this. Your emotions are no, are no substitute for truth. Did this make sense? So real love, the love that Paul is saying, hey, I appreciate the love you've shown me. I never want it to stop. God is doing this in you. But now I'm praying that this love abounds in you and grows into a love that doesn't just do all of the amazing, awesome stuff, but a love that then supports an embrace of sound doctrine and discernment. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm just going to say this. Please hear me out. Please. This is important for our time. And, and I'm telling you this pastorally, not prophetically, but predictively. There is a, there is a real need for instruction like this in our, in our future. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? This church has 300 people and they do this. I am not interested in keeping up with the Joneses. I'm not interested in bandwagoning. I am interested in the truth. And I'm interested in love being expressed to the fullest possibility, which means we don't rest our laurels on feeling good when we come to church. We rest in the doctrine that is preached from the Bible. That should make us feel good, by the way. So true love discerns and discards. It doesn't stop and say, oh, man, I went to church and I felt good. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? If you get them with pizza, you got to keep them with pizza. I hope you understand my point. Oh, we provide a world-class experience and people come in and they go, oh, my goodness, I absolutely love this. There is nothing wrong with providing an amazing experience. But, but at some point, the novelty will wear off. Hence, Taylor Swift's 12 boyfriends. You follow? Y'all like Taylor, I'm so sorry, I'm not trying to diss Taylor Swift, but let's be honest, that's the spirit of the age in which we live. Hence Tinder, hence Bumble, hence whatever. What do you know of these? I, I don't know. I've never been on them, I promise. All these apps that are just for hookups because the world has come to a staggeringly tragic acknowledgement of the fact that what we call love wears off after a while, unless it matures into something substantial. Yeah. All right. So true love discerns and discards. You get, a, you get a hand of poker, you say, I got to put this away. So here's just my notes on this. The Berean church set the pace. Paul said, hey, I got something to tell you. The Bereans, also a Macedonian church, said, hold on, Paul, let's grab our Bibles. You know what I'm saying? Come on, guys. Hey, the Lord spoke to me personally in a dream. I'm not saying that that can't happen, but I'm going to grab my Bible. Saints. <laughs> Well, I tell you, I had a revelation from God, and he told me I should be doing this. Not saying it didn't happen, but let me grab my Bible. Come on, guys. I, I do not trust myself enough. I'm a goofball, guys. I'm a goofball. You know, I, Amen. He's like, we'll concede that, brother. We'll concede it. <laughs> I'm a goofball. I don't trust myself enough to say, oh, man, it was 9.38 p.m., and the Lord told me that he actually took the form of a Hindu monkey god back in 1914. No, come on, guys. That's bad pizza is what it is. <laughs> you ate too much. You didn't have the Tums that Cheryl suggested that we bring for next, you know, for the... <laughs> Here's the thing. In reality, these... We need to... True love discerns and discards. You say, oh, it is not loving. You, please listen. You say, it is not loving to shoot somebody down when they say, I had a word from the Lord and he told me this. Guys, it is the most loving thing you can do. Did you hear what I said? It is the most loving thing you can do, is to say that is, that is false doctrine. Now, there is a terrible way to go about this. Hey, you know, I want to let you know that the Lord, uh, the Lord gave me a third personal private prayer language, and now I'd like to recite Psalm 23 to you in it. I love you, <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm not going to, real love doesn't affirm or confirm confusion. Come on, saints. I know this is, this is a little sticky, right? Real love doesn't affirm or confirm confusion. Real love. Does, can, I, can I bring it a little bit closer to home? We all, I think all, at this point in our lives, all of us know someone or is acquainted with someone or a friend of a friend who's involved in a transgender movement in America. Someone says, hey, I want you to say I'm a, a woman, even though I was born a boy. I want you to call me this. Guys, true love, truest love, a mature love says, I love you too much. To affirm that in you. You say, that's your stance? That's my stance. Now, again, there's the wrong way to do about it. I'm not going to call you that. Let me tell you, when God created Adam and Eve, it wasn't Adam and Steve. Let me tell you. No, come on. You just go lay down. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Go lay down. There's right ways to do it. There's right ways to have com Nobody wants to have conversations anymore. We don't even know how. Right. We don't even know how. But there's right ways to have conversation with people in love, knowing that they're completely cloaked in love. But the truest form of love is a doctrine-loving love. I don't like the word doctrine. Then put teaching or biblical principle or mind of God. All right, moving on. So true love discerns and discards. Please listen to this. True love doesn't jump on new bandwagons just because they're new, but it doesn't stay on old bandwagons just because they're old. 
Well, I'm not jumping on that new band. Why can't I just watch that preacher? He's 29 years old. What's he going to tell me that I don't? Well, I can think of a couple things he needs to tell you, to be honest with you. <laughs> or this is the way we've always done it. By God's grace, this is the way it's always going to be done. <laughs> I watched it. I, I tell you what, this is this is not okay. I don't know. I, I'm not going to say who. But during this uh, during this event this last weekend, it was very stressful. It was very it was paradigm shifting for many of us. It was tragic for so many families. On Facebook, all of these warriors came out. They're like, "Hey, if you need anybody, want to let you know I'm standing by my own individually created militia." Uh, and it's like, and then he's like, "Hey." I'll keep watch. Let's go plan. We'll convene here, 1032 in Bush. Got him at gunpoint. Coverage code three. And it's like, dude, like, you're going to shoot somebody and it's not going to be the right guy. You know what I mean? You know, I'm just, right? And again, they, they mean well. They mean, they mean well, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I just, I'm going to move on from that point. All right, here we go. So my point is, the way we've always done it doesn't make things right. And if it's new to you, if it's new to you, number one, doesn't mean it's new and it doesn't mean it's wrong. Are you still with me, Saints? I got one point left. You've done, you've done great. We got chili afterwards, and it's extra spicy. It'll wake you right up. All right, here we go. Love means examining what we believe and therefore how we behave with insight and discernment committed to discarding untruth and embracing sound doctrine. Well, that's not the way I've always done it. It does not matter. You can tell what a church loves when you say, here's what the Bible says. This actually isn't a biblical principle. That's right when you can tell what a person or a church loves. Do they love what they've always done, or do they love the truth? Are you following me? I hope you are. You know what I'm saying, Kev? You can tell what a church loves. You can tell who a church worships, who an individual worships, who a church loves. When you say, hey, here's what the Bible says about this. Maybe you've been told this, but I'm going to tell you why it's not true. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to listen to that because that's deception. No, it's new to you, but it's not new to the world. It's not untrue. It is true. We just have to be willing to have a mature love for the truth enough to embrace doctrine over sometimes our own tradition. And like I say, the caution goes the other way around. We don't jump on new bandwagon just because they're new. Hey, they came out with a new translation of the Bible. I'm all about it. Let's hold off for a second, right? Let's study. Let's research. Some of them out there are pretty trashy. Are you hearing me? All right, moving on to the third point. Y'all want chili. I can tell y'all want chili. It's cool. Point number three, verse three. This is very simple. True love purifies and protects. The presence of sound doctrine and mature discernment, they keep us from missing the mark. What is the mark? The mark is living in God's good world in God's good way. God made us to live in a certain way in his world. You say, yeah, we're not like that shooter. I agree, we're not like that shooter. What about the guy who signed off on a medicine that he knew would hurt people? but it would pocket a couple more hundred thousand dollars. Right? I'm just saying. Well, I, I tell you this. What about the person who stole something? It wasn't going to hurt anybody, but it actually did impact the bottom line of that mom and pop shop, shop and caused them to shut down and ruin. Are you, are you hearing me? You say, I'd never be like that shooter. I'd never know. And I'm thankful you wouldn't. That is a terrible transgression. But why do we think that our ripples won't affect the, the water just as much? Well, there was a big ripple. It's not the only ripple, guys. And by the way, whatever, whatever happened in his life was predicated by someone missing the mark at some point ago. Well, it was mental illness. Why do you think that's caused? Could it be in our diet? Could it be in the... I'm just saying, I'm just being real with you. In God's good world, people don't walk around sinning and living for themselves in, in, in a hundred ways. Are you still with me? So when we say sin, all sin means is a fancy way of saying not living in God's good world, God's good way. Last part of this, last point. An immature love may desire to do this, but complete love is buttressed and reinforced with the truth and therefore keeps us from veering into error and sin. Again, guys, when I read this passage and I've read it and I've read it and I've read it, and the only thing I can think of is very well-meaning Christians who say, I do not want to fall into doctrinal error. 
I do not want to fall into a way of living that I know is not pure or right. And I am telling you that a lot of that absolutely has to do with who or what you love. Who or what you love. Do you love the scripture? Do you love the truth? Yeah, but I got to tell you, some of those sayings are, uh, you know, and in my experience, so what you're saying is you love your experience. Well, this is what works for us. We've had to make some adjustments to biblical teaching in order to find, no, no, no. So what you're saying is you love your idea. I'm, I'm not trying to be too hard on people, but I'm just being very transparent with you. Love. Love. So true love purifies and protects. So it looks and learns, it discerns and discards, and it purifies and protects. In other words, it gets rid of anything that could distract from keeping the main thing, the main thing, which is simply following God as he's revealed in his scriptures. Not as he's revealed in your mind, not as he's revealed in your feeling, but in the scriptures. So here's how I'm going to end this. A couple more slides. Sadly, our age is not one characterized by Christians submitting themselves to the scriptures and the timeless truth, but rather to perceived personal revelation or pragmatic conclusions derived from private practice. Okay, so that's a lot of words, Britt. Immature love says, I love you, Lord, and I am here to worship. I'm here to bow down, but is not willing to take the next step and say, is there any way in me that's missing the mark or am I just trying to say, well, I love Christ and he's blessed me and there's no way that I could... You know what I'm saying? I hope you understand what I'm saying. Doctrine is important and it will reveal who you love. True love is... Here it is. A true love for Christ will willingly, sometimes painfully, submit to learning, obeying, and living in God's good world, God's good way, just as he always wanted. And it's for our flourishing and for his glory. So here's the last slide. In the end, I'm going to define one of those Greek words, just one. The word sincere, uh, let's see, ilikrinos, ilikrinos. It's a compound word. Remember what krinos is in Greek, son? Judge. That's right, judge, well done, well done. Krino, we were just doing the Greek school work together last week. I came home early, and uh, I would either contribute or I would hinder. <laughs> My wife was like, do not turn on that TV when I'm homeschooling. You know what I'm saying, right? And uh, actually I said, would it distract the kids if I turned on the TV? She's like, yes. <laughs> so I picked up a book and tried to help, you know, with something. And turns out my son knows more about Greek than I do, which, is, which means I need to brush up. But <laughs> krinos means to judge that that eile has to do with sunlight. The, the word actually, has, it means judge by sunlight. You say, that's, that's kind of weird. Well, sh well sh sure it is, I guess. But um, did you guys happen to know that I enjoy trading and collecting and selling Pokemon cards? I know that's news to you. I know, I know. Right, right. Who, who could have imagined, right? One of the worst things that can happen to a Pokemon card is if it's not UV protected and you leave it in the sun. What happens to it? It fades. It gets all washed away. And you're like, here's my BGS graded 10 Scyther card. Well, it's not there anymore, but it was there at some point. It's white now. You know what I'm saying? It's judged by sunlight. And when it was judged by sunlight, it was found wanting. It wasn't strong. It didn't hold up to the sun. So here's what Paul's point is in 9 through 11. If you want to hold up against sunlight, pastor talked about the storms of life this morning. If you want to, if you want to, hold up against the sunlight, I promise you, your zeal, your affections, your expressions, your gushy love for God, while good, will not help you stand up against the sunlight of this world. Does that make sense? It will be a commitment to doctrine. It will be a commitment to the scriptures. That is mature love. And you say, Pastor, this, this message didn't really have any like, is thy heart right with God moments. It wasn't very you know, deep and no real, no real times when we slow down and manipulate the moment. But I will say this passage was very important to me because Paul's point is so relevant for today. When you are exposed to Bible teaching, please listen, I'm really winding down. When you're exposed to Bible teaching, when you're exposed to someone sharing their experience with you, spiritual or not, 
when you visit another church, whatever the case may be, I need you. You need you. God needs you to be discerning and to see past. Not that it's bad. We're not saying it's bad, saints, but to see past those first level expressions of love and to say, okay, what's, what's really being taught? What's really being expressed? And in time, you may come to hate TV commercials just as much as I do, yeah. right? You, may, you say, I don't like them because they're loud and annoying. I don't like them because they're teaching messages in about 30 seconds, yeah. right? Yeah. They teach, oh boy, let's go to the beach and have fun. Yeah. And they set expectations because whatever product is there, you know how commercials work. Guys, doctrine's the same way. Doctrine's the same way. So let's be discerning. Corey. I have a quick question. You keep saying that, it, that it's not bad. Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time understanding why because if someone is teaching doctrine and they're not teaching it the, the correct way and they're picking out things that go with what they want. To yeah, yeah. How is that? Is that not what's wrong with the world today? So how is it not bad? No, that's a really good point, right? Let me put it this way. An exclusive approach to those first level love. You know what I mean by now when I say first level love, that kind of puppy love, infatuation, expression. They're not bad in and of themselves, but an exclusive approach to those and a prioritization of those expressions over doctrine is bad. And that is the way things are going. However, if I walk into a church and everybody's having a blast and they're, they've got their worship team and they're jumping up and down and they're praising the Lord, I'm not going to go, oh, this is, this is bad. This is wicked. All that emotion. No, the emotion's not bad. But if that's the pinnacle of their doctrinal teaching, then we can say that is not helpful. It's and it's immature. it's immature. Exactly right, Kim. It's immature. So it's not, I don't, oh boy. It's almost like I should have just stayed with that word the whole time. Kim, thank you for bringing me full circles. We can land this plane with the rudders down and we won't have much turbulence. Um, it's when the little kids running around having a blast and they're, you've seen them on Wednesday nights. We're done. They're just... <laughs> You say, what was that? Well, it looks silly when I do it. I'm supposed to be more mature, right? It's not bad that they do it. Does that make sense so far? It's not bad that they do it. It's just, you know, not for their age, but for an adult, it's immature. But for a child, it's fine. So Paul's saying, let's grow and make sure we're not just stopping at, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Let's move through that, with that, into the stuff that will hold up against the sunlight. Because you come and you have a great experience. Guys, I'm sorry. It's not going to weather the sunlight. And by the way, what do you mean by weather by sunlight? Stop preaching, Britt. Please give me a second. Remember the parable of the sower? Remember the parable of the sower? The guy threw out some seeds. What was one of the things that killed the seeds? The sun. Well, it was the thorn. That was one of them out of the four. The second one was the sun. It was too harsh. And it killed them. Their faith died because it wasn't deep. It wasn't deep. And Paul is saying real love seeks deep faith so that when the sun hits, it won't wither and perish. That make sense? All right. Lord, I love you. Thank you so much for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in church together. Father, as we, as we enjoy this time together of Chris's chili, we commemorate the life of a wonderful, truly wonderful young man and his committed parents and family. And we can turn mourning into rejoicing because of the